what we're going to do to try to get audience participation, where each person on the panel is going to just say a few comments, um, general comments, either where at their seat or at the podium, whichever they're more comfortable with. It's a little crowded there. We want to try to bring the audience into a discussion of Vietnam and the 72 campaign. Uh, they're both interchangeable in many ways. So instead of doing large um, warm-ups or, or introductions here, I'll make them very brief. And um, I think what might be the best, um, Steve, do you want to come up? This is your talk there. Yeah, what, he's just going to make a few comments on his paper, and then we'll um, just very briefly, and then we'll start going through each panelist to make a couple remarks. Uh, thanks a lot, Doug. And uh, it's certainly an honor for me to be uh, associated with this symposium, and in particular, this distinguished panel. Um, certainly, I've considered staying up here all day just to receive the glow from them, but I, I promise you I will be very brief. Um, <laughs> amid the aftermath of the 1968 uh, election, George McGovern chaired the Commission on Party Structure and Delegate Selection, a name the press simplified to the McGovern Commission. Ultimately, its members developed a series of guidelines designed to increase the number of presidential primaries and to make delegates to future conventions more responsive than in the past to rank and file Democrats. The commission also served as a catalyst for the birth of a new brand of politics within the party. The relatively successful efforts to reform the party not only vaulted the commission recommendations into party law, but also diluted the traditional influence of labor and local party bosses in favor of more progressive activist Democrats. You all know the, the story of the uh, 72 campaign, so I won't go over that, but suffice it to say that, the, in general, the regard for the campaign has remained unchanged since 1972. As the New York Times put it, uh, McGovern ran a gallant campaign and showed his confidence in the rightness of his vision of America. But the editorial acknowledged that because of his politi political base being too narrow, the social outlook allegedly too radical, McGovern lost. Since then, uh, neoconservative analysts have um, come into the fray as well. And as uh, subsequent presidential elections have uh, seen the demise of a Democratic Party, uh, Ronald Radish offered the newest of, these, of this interpretation, and his title is, in fact, the book of of his is called Divided They Fell, The Demise of the Democratic Party. It focuses on the political effects of the reform movement, and he places the demise of the Democrats squarely on the shoulders of George McGovern and the Reform Commission he chaired. I quote from him, gearing the party to liberal constituency groups and activists rather than to traditional, de a traditional democratic electorate, McGovern opened up the party to a course that would, over the decades, result in a steady loss of electoral support. As you'll be all glad to know, my paper is a rejection of this interpretation. I was expecting applause. Very good. Erroneously, critics of the McGovern Commission depend upon the clarity of hindsight to distort the party's reaction to the events of 1968. By focusing on the Republican victories in the presidential elections of the 1970s and 80s and moving backward, Radish and other neoconservatives have neglected the context in which the Democrats formed their political strategies in the late 1960s and early 70s. Instead of viewing the McGovern Commission as a reasonable response to Nixon's victory in 68, critics dismiss it as ideological folly. They infer that had the Democrats not reformed themselves, the party would have chosen a stronger candidate in 1972 and perhaps defeated Nixon. In turn, they conclude that the party would have stemmed the tide of conservatism that's, that surfaced in the 1980s. Radish's work suffers in particular from his attempt to defend this ne negative supposition. In his book, he not only ignored the strategy that the Democratic Party developed in the aftermath of the uh, 68 election, but he also overlooked evidence suggesting that the reform effort had rejuvenated the party by 1970. My paper examines the first two years of the McGovern Commission, 1969 and 1970. During this period, McGovern and other party leaders focused almost exclusively upon the results of the election of 1968 
and followed a path that they believed would revitalize the Democratic Party. Those who served on the McGovern Commission and supported its work did so as a rational and well-intentioned well response to the election results. Indeed, the McGovern Commission soon became the most dynamic entity within the party. Eventually, the fervor of reform-oriented groups, the vast voting potential of a new generation of young voters, and the results of the midterm elections of 1970 convinced party leaders, including George McGovern, of the reform path's promise. In sum, McGovern and the Democrats chose to reform the party for the most compelling reason. A reformed party structure appeared to offer the best chance for future electoral success. Thank you very much. I should have mentioned Steve Ward's at American University, and he's working on a, his a project on this, so he, I'm sorry I had to give him a truncated version of that, but it'll be one of the papers in the book. We have so many people here from 72 campaign, and we'll just start with Bob Shrum on that end, and then we'll go to, um, to Hunter Thompson. But let's begin with um, Bob Shrum, who I think we all know um, covered the campaign and, and, and is a leading journalist in America. Hey, do better than that. No, right, no, I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's Hunter. <laughs> Hunter covered some version of the campaign. Yeah, uh, some version of the guy. Uh, I, that's identifying. Uh, I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to, to have Senator McGovern and John Holm and Frank Mankiewicz let me join the campaign as a speechwriter. It was one of the best experiences of my entire life. I believe the campaign made three singular contributions. First, Senator McGovern told the truth about two great issues, Vietnam and Watergate. I remember at one point in the fall, uh, we got some polling advice saying people weren't really buying this and we should talk maybe about some other things. And I remember his reaction is, then what am I running for? Uh, it was a rare example, I think, of what one ought to do in politics, which is actually stand for something one believes. Secondly, he became, and I think this is often forgotten, uh, a tribune of issues that we're going to move to the center of future debate and change in America. I think first of tax reform and simplification, uh, which Time Magazine at the time, in the middle of the campaign, wrote a piece saying this will be an issue for the next generation. Secondly, of campaign reform and public integrity, when he said this is the most corrupt administration in American history, he got a lot of criticism. It was true. And he really advanced, I think, the whole cause of running different kinds of campaigns. And thirdly, at least for a lot of us in a time of disillusion and cynicism, he gave an example of integrity and grace. He wasn't desperate. He didn't run around looking for something he could say that would please people at the moment. And ultimately, he was driven by principle and not polls and gimmicks. I think there were three tragedies in the campaign. First, the nation never really saw Senator McGovern for the principled and sensible person he was. That was partly our fault because the acceptance speech was given at 3 a.m. in the morning wasn't his fault. He couldn't do anything about it at that point. I mean, we were trapped in a process that was very protracted. Secondly, I think 72, with the exception of Hunter and Bill Greider and a few other people, saw the rise of horse race reporting and the decline of substance coverage. I remember at one point the senator gave a very serious proposal on the environment, big speech. The only place it was covered was in the New York Times. And I asked several reporters what happened, and they said people don't want to hear about that. Uh, thirdly, the Eagleton affair, uh, I think, damaged us very greatly. I do not myself think that we would have won without it, but I think we would have won 10 <clears throat> states or so. And then I think George McGovern would have been viable far into the future as a presidential candidate. I have two vivid memories of election night. The first is personal. It's John Holm and Sandy Berger and I sitting on the floor in the room with Senator McGovern, and he looked down and smiled at us and said, there they are, the men who wrote the words that moved the nation. Uh, uh, in, 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 his, in his concession speech, he quoted Adlai Stevenson quoting Lincoln. And looking back over 25 years, and I find it hard to believe it's 25 years, I'd paraphrase that quote. Uh, if you look back at that campaign 25 years later, it still hurts too much to laugh, but it was way too glorious and too authentic to ever cry. We wanted to have Bob go first because he may be having to take off in a, in a few minutes. That's why we're trying to get him to the beginning of it. Uh, He's one word to speak of the Hubert, Hubert Humphrey rally somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well let the, our next speaker is Dr. Hunter S. Thompson, who I think you all are familiar with. 
uh, a political journalist, fiction writer, and also wrote, of course, The Campaign Trail, 1972. He has a new book coming out now called The Proud Highway, which is a collection of his letters, which will be out in June. And I think Gen um, Senator McGovern's called the book Campaign Trail 72, Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail, the best book that emerged out of that, um, out of that campaign. So, Hunter? Oh, yeah. Hi. Well, let's see. Thank you, George, for that. This fucking thing is not coming toward me. Is that right? Are we on? All right. Hi. I'm not sure what to say, but uh, you're talking about Sioux Falls, South Dakota, is that right? That night? Election night? Yes. That remains one of the truly heinous nights of my life. In, in memory, it, uh, it's like a deep, you know, one of those scars that heals, but it has nerve endings loose in it and, you know, itches all the time or when you bang it on something or when it rains. Yeah, it was a, uh, a nasty night. But the, uh, I'm not going to speak here. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, uh, you know, say hello. We can talk to people. I was not prepared for a speech like Bob's. Actually, I want to hear Mankiewicz try to explain why this happened. And why that everything has been criticized in these uh, moments of uh, other people speaking, why it all traces back, Frank, to you. But <laughs> 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 my, 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 my life, somehow, I don't blame George. He's a decent man. But ye gods, I mean, uh, we have to look at the root of uh, maybe perhaps one of the, you know, the most decent, elegant, maybe foolish campaigns ever. And they were taken over by a dark op like Frank here. <laughs> that was another one of my uh, major experiences in that campaign, just dealing with Mankiewicz. Uh, I didn't know Lee Atwater well, but uh, I understood but the principles that made him move. And let me tell you that Frank is, Frank is darker than almost anybody I've ever seen. <laughs> No, I'll come back. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my moments here for a second so you can, in decency, let's, it's my good friend, Frank Michaelitz. Frank, do you want to jump in on this? Come on in, Frank. <laughs> I just, um, here. Every once in a while, Hunter come, Hunter, I guess he hasn't for a while, but he used to come to Washington fairly regularly and stay with us. Right. Right. I see, I used to know when Hunter was due to come to Washington because I would start to get his mail. Uh, <laughs> he would have it forwarded, which was a sure sign that soon he would be on our doorstep. Uh, but he hasn't done it lately. I'm, I'm not sure why. Uh, I, I don't know what uh, Senator McGovern said about uh, Hunter's book, Fear and Loathing on the camp tra Campaign Trail, but I have been quoted many times, and I'll say it again. It was the most accurate and least factual account of that campaign. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a lot. Yeah. You want to think about that. Uh, just a, a, a few brief uh, uh, comments here. I think uh, there's a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to... to maybe uh, think less of the rules, the new rules and the government commission and the, all the rest of it, I don't think it had that much of an impact. Uh, I think George McGovern would have won the nomination under any set of rules uh, because he had the issue. No question that uh, the overwhelming majority of uh, voters in, what was it, 21 Democratic primaries uh, uh, felt as strongly about uh, the Vietnam War as he did. Uh, and I believe we'd have won, uh, as it was, he won 11 primaries. I think he probably would have won that many, maybe a few more. Uh, so I just, I, I, I don't think the rules change has uh, had that much impact, and I don't think it's rather widely known that George McGovern didn't even favor all the rules changes. Uh, I think if you go back and look and listen to some of the things he was saying, he probably <laughs> thought the commission maybe went a little too far in some areas. I think George would have liked to protect winner take all, at least in California, at least in 1972. Uh, and maybe a few other uh, uh, less drastic uh, changes. But it, as I say, I don't think it mattered. Uh, I've read something of what Mr. Is it Radish? 
mm-hmm. had to say, I don't understand why anybody spends any time on him at all. Uh, here's a guy, along with others, along with others in, in, the, in the mid-90s, early 90s, who decided the Democratic Party was finished uh, and wrote a book about it, only to discover uh, that we've now won two presidential elections in a row and probably are set to win a third and maybe take back the Congress again. And are certainly, it, it's far from a, a party that is, what's the word, that has had its demise. Um, people read, the New, York, be they read the New York Times enough and they read about all the angry white males and decided the Democratic Party was indeed finished and then found out they were wrong. So I think we can... Uh, we can uh, do without uh, any further uh, serious consideration of those guys. And Radish, of course, only exemplifies a, a large number. I want to talk about one thing in the campaign that Bob Schrum uh, talked about, which was the, the emergence of, I think, an entirely different view of campaigning and politics uh, in the American media. Uh, it was, as it turns out, the hinge uh, between print coverage and television coverage. Uh, By 1976, you had a purely television campaign. 1968, I think it had been largely print. 1972, you also found, however, an extraordinary uh, overtaking of campaign coverage by what has been called, I think accurately, the the Teddy White syndrome. Teddy was a marvelous political reporter who wrote a book in 1960 called The Making of the President, 1960, and then wrote one each four years after that. And he really did revolutionize political coverage because he stayed with the campaigns and he wrote about things that nobody had written about before. (coughs) Money, uh, how campaign contributions were developed, uh, endorsements, how you got sheriffs to support the campaign, what it meant in West Virginia to have certain people for you and against you, how uh, um, uh, campaigns were conducted, polling, fundraising, uh, all the rest of the speech writing, all the, the uh, uh, techniques of campaigning, and very little on the substance which he wasn't trying to get at. But he was talking about how campaigns were conducted and how eventually they were won and lost. And that book had a profound influence on everybody, I think almost everyone, who wrote uh, about politics for a living. And I think the American press, the political press, ever since, have tried very hard without thinking about it to write that book every day. Uh, And those are the issues that you hear about. Those are the issues that are endlessly chewed over. I remember one uh, memorable day in, uh, in Illinois Senator McGovern, I think, uh, I think it was Sandy Berger, maybe it was Bob Schrum, but in any event, they had uncovered another terrible scandal in the Nixon administration, which was that, to put it fairly uh, uh, bluntly, the administration sold out the wheat farmers in order to get the Soviet Union to shut up when we bombed the harbor in Haiphong. That's about what it came down to. And the result was that there was this terrible grain scandal the, uh, the administration had uh, downplayed the amount of grain that the Soviet Union was going to want. And finally, when they wanted a great deal, the price was low. They made a, a, a disadvantageous deal for the wheat farmers. The Assistant Secretary of Agriculture wound up with a new apartment in New York and a job with one of the big grain companies. It was a hell of a speech. And he gave the speech in uh, his first stop in uh, downstate Illinois in wheat country. And I remember going over with the reporters the key phrases in the speech to be sure they caught it all and got all the uh, basic charges. And when the speech was over, Senator McGovern entertained uh, the press that was traveling with us and some of the ones who had come over for the speech. And the first question and the second question and the third question and the fourth question (coughs) all concerned this key Teddy White issue. Here you are in Illinois for your first visit in the campaign. How come Mayor Daley wasn't here to greet you? (laughs) Legitimate question to be sure, but hardly the most important one that day at that time for that speech. And I think that's, that became fairly typical of the coverage in 1972, and it has been fairly typical of the coverage ever since. Are you criticizing me, Frank? Uh, Only indirectly. (laughs) (laughs) I'd like to get Morris Dees in on this. Uh, Morris is one of the sponsors of Southern Poverty Law of this. um, Involved with fundraising in this 72 campaign. I thought he might want to say a few words about that. 
Thank you, Doug. Well, I was, I was rather glad to get the call in 1971 from Senator McGovern to come to Washington to help him get a letter out announcing his campaign. I was glad because having sued George Wallace to integrate the all-white state troopers in 1970, I'd rather limited my political career in my home state. <laughs> but when I, was, when I was driving to the airport to take the flight to Washington, I was listening. We have a rather conservative state in Central McGovern, apparently wasn't held in too high regard, considered unpatriotic. And I was listening to Merle Haggard's song, Okie from Muskogee. Yes, and I never will forget the line, when you're putting down my my country horse, you're walking on the fighting side of me. So I arrived in Washington with some trepidation. But I was met by Henry Kimmelman, who I wish was here today, and Miles Rubin and Stan Kaplan and others who helped me work on the fundraising that made this campaign possible. Senator McGovern certainly was supported by millions of individuals in this country. And in direct mail, it only took getting the letters to the right people. With the help of Tom Collins, who's a brilliant copywriter, we wrote a letter announcing his campaign in 1972. Senator McGovern, I think, through some of his aides, had written a little one-page letter. And I said, Senator, you know, we've got to tell the whole story. And he allowed me to read all of his speeches. And we wrote a seven-page letter to mail out. Now, he didn't like the seven-page letter because some of his educated friends uh, at Harvard said it wasn't going to work. He'd be the laughing stock. So we mailed the seven-page letter anyway without him knowing it. <laughs> And I never will forget a touching incident in that campaign, because uh, I'd been in the direct mail business all my life, and I knew that long letters outpull little short letters. So uh, Pat Donovan, who's sitting here today, called me on the phone and said, come to Washington, the Senator wants to speak to you. Well, some of those letters had come back to the Senate office. We used the Senate letterhead, and uh, today you can't do that. But we did then, and those letters had come back to return bad addresses, and Senator McGovern apparently had seen one of them. And so he, I said, well, I can't come. I'm trying a case back home. I'll come soon. I wanted some results to hopefully come in. Well, Senator McGovern called me, and he may not remember this, but I remember it well. He called me and uh, said, Morris. He said, and he began to read a letter he had gotten from a woman who had received and sent to him a $10,000 check, and that's what the federal government paid somebody who lost their son in Vietnam. And she had sent that check in an envelope to send to McGovern and said that, that he, she wanted him to have that check instead of her. She didn't want that blood money. And from then, it's always history since. We collected $24 million from some 600,000 people. And I think that was just a token, though. That was a token of the grassroots support. And it wasn't just from young people. We got letters from people sending their Social Security check saying that they had been around long enough to know that President Nixon and others was wrong and Senator McGovern was right. I want to thank Senator McGovern here today also when that campaign was over for letting the Southern Poverty Law Center have full access to those 600,000 people. And he wrote the first letter out asking them to support our organization. And today we have 350,000 supporters. Senator McGovern is one of our biggest ones. Thank you. You know, it was, it, it was very interesting this morning uh, when that one of the speakers pulled out a check which he had sent to Senator McGovern for $5. Because most of those checks that Morris is talking about were in very small denominations. $10, $20, $30. Dear Senator McGovern, I don't have much money, but I want to stop the war. Uh, the little bank that we did business with across the street from the K Street headquarters, which in itself was an adventure, uh, was getting around 5,000, 10,000 checks a day. And the, the manager of the bank came across the street to see Gary Hart and, and me and said, these are essentially uncollected funds. Somebody is going to have to sign for these uncollected funds who can stand good for them because we don't know whether they're good or not. And you keep asking me for the money because you want to buy television time that day or radio time. Long story short, I signed for them. And out of $24 million, and out of tens of thousands of checks, there were $7,000 worth of bad checks, there are that, which is the smallest percentage anybody ever heard of anywhere. And there was a kind of innocence with that political contributions to the McGovern campaign. And what George McGovern deserves great credit for, 
since he is the last presidential candidate to do this, was to spawn a group of people who refused to be cynics. Some of them are old like me, and some of them are younger, and a lot of them are in the Clinton administration. But Bob, is that smart or not? Uh, Pardon? Is that smart? Oh, excuse me, son. Is it, have we learned something from, from that? Well, I think, I think it's important to believe in what you're for. And I detest the fact that there are so many young people today who are constantly telling me in Charlotte, North Carolina, that politics doesn't matter, when in fact it matters to everybody. And it's because the nature of the candidates and the compromise with television and the compromise with principle, because otherwise you can't get the $400,000 contribution from the Liggett Myers Tobacco Company. And that bothers the hell out of me, because all I give a damn about are my three grandchildren. And I want them to have the better world that I thought we were working for, that I worked for in many campaigns with Frank in Kennedy campaigns and in the McGovern campaign. And I regret none of it. I am grateful for all of it, to hell with the Nixons of the world, for now and forever, in or out of the grave, and I'm not sure he won't come back. I think, why don't we open it up to the audience a little bit, and you could direct your questions to the group or an individual. Anybody want to start off? Come on, speak up, somebody out there. Yes, sir. There has to be some Nazi. Yes, yes. Um, I'd like to... Uh, address this to Mr. Mankiewicz. Uh, we heard what Mike Breko uh, said when he called you. Uh, he quoted you as, as saying that you would not have, that the, uh, the candidate, uh, Senator McGovern, would never have said to the lady on the uh, Ozark Airlines plane uh, what he said. Um, I'm wondering if you might comment on the Ann Arbor, Michigan incident. Ann Arbor, huh? I Oh, all right. Well, uh, that was a very simple matter. Uh, Senator McGovern getting a lot of heat those days. Uh, I think it was in, it was the site of the Jackson State Prison in, uh, in Michigan. And uh, he was working the fence. And when he finished, some reporter who had been following him for the pool, I guess, came to me and said, well, you know, some kid was giving Senator McGovern a hard time. And the senator said to him, Listen, buddy, you can kiss my ass. And the story began to get around <laughs> uh, as being in the pool report. And as I recall, I uh, indicated, and I thought wisely, that it was unlikely that since Senator Kennedy was the Democratic nominee that he would have said, kiss my elephant. And it did. <laughs> it did deflect the incident a little bit, but, uh, but to me, uh, to me, it made uh, Senator McGovern seem all the all the better a candidate. And I notice you've got a KMA button on your lapel left over from that moment. Uh, I think on balance, we probably benefited from it. Other questions? Isn't it shameful that Frank yes. is denying his responsibility for the campaign? Yes, question for uh, Mr. Thompson. In Fear and Loathing 72, uh, your rhetoric was actually much harsher against Hubert Humphrey than against Nixon. I was wondering, is that because Nixon was essentially unavailable, or your expectations for the Democrats were so much greater? I think it was because uh, I was offended more by Humphrey's treachery than I was by Nixon's pure evil, <laughs> <laughs> which I, I still miss. <laughs> yeah, he was a giant. And it was Humphrey's treachery that defined him. Uh, Christ, with, with Nixon, the treachery didn't work, did it? I mean, was it, it was like an ingrained uh, sort of uh, the price of do, doing business with Nixon was to assume he was treacherous and real treacherous, bad, evil treacherous. Uh, I remember George in California. We went on at a, uh, some big stage or theater somewhere, and you and Humphrey were there together. And, and he just fucking, he, he had uttered some utterly treacherous thing, like, I'm a Jew too, and I'll fight to the death for them. You know, whoever's against Jews. I don't know. And some utter uh, double cross. That you, I remember you 
We were back in the caverns of some kind of a film studio, and you crossed paths with uh, with Humphrey, and uh, California was a nasty one, wasn't it? That was a bastard. <laughs> yeah. And if it, uh, at that point, I remember your anger. I've forgotten exactly what the issue was. I don't know. Was it was that, that, that helicopter, that plane full of billions of dollars that, got, that landed somewhere in the desert that you, you told me about? Humphrey's money coming into the... Frank is so fucking inscrutable. I guess that's what... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that. Yes. Well, never mind. <laughs> but there was that... I remember real anger there and then that... Uh, and you're filming commercials or some, some show, uh, like a Sunday news show or something. God, I can't believe we went by in those days with no satellites. You know, we actually had to deal with film, moving it. Uh, and then these moments were precious. I remember George and, and, uh, and Hubert. I never thought Hubert was a bad person uh, until I had to deal with him in, you know, in front. And he was a treacherous bastard. He had no more honor, or no more ethics, or no more decency. Despite all of his uh, bleeding heart bullshit that he put out, he rode an anti-communist goddamn uh, wave into wherever he was. He was a liberal, in a word. <laughs> Sorry. Whoop, I'll get off. But I remember George and, and, and Hubert meeting there, and that, that was that pure anger. Uh, George was as offended as I was, and I think that I, uh... yeah, by that time I got pretty nasty and kind of personalized the campaign. And Humphrey offended me, I'm trying to answer your question, and he offended George, and I believe that's the, uh, that was the shared instinct. Let me ask I... Senator McGovern, how did you deal with Hunter Thompson and Rolling Stone on the campaign trail? He was me, he was me. campaign uh, trail was the uh, book jacket in which it showed uh, Hunter and I sitting on an airplane and the inscription under the picture is uh, Senator George McGovern is showing is shown here uh, imploring Dr. Hunter Thompson to be his vice presidential <laughs> uh, I, uh, I don't know whether that sold books or not but uh, uh, I must say, I run into that book even yet all over this country. It's uh, become a kind of a folk piece of the 72 campaign. I hope uh, Hunter has gotten as rich from it as it appears to me, traveling around the country, <laughs> running into it everywhere I go. Oh boy, there's a long story there. Yeah. <laughs> to say one other thing, that book was written for Rolling Stones as the as the campaign progressed, it wasn't something written from the hindsight of the campaign. Those right, chapters right. rolled off uh, his uh, typewriter as the campaign uh, moved along. And um, it was really rather remarkable, the foresight he had as to what was going to happen. He forecast the results of the primary bid and described uh, a lot of things in a, in a rather uh, I thought uh, prophetic uh, context, so uh, you may be a little bit startled by some of the uh, language you've heard uh, here today, but uh, uh, with Hunter, what you see is what you get. And, uh, this, um, all I can say is that uh, Frank described that book accurately. I'd forgotten exactly how he worded it, but I remember it was something to the effect this is the most uh, inaccurate book about the campaign but the most truthful and there's a lot of a lot of uh, thought behind that statement i think it pretty well describes it and it's the reason i enjoyed traveling with him during the campaign <laughs> There are other questions from the audience let me just say that oh. george you were the most fun i ever had on any campaign it's uh if it was all like that i'd still be running around here with a notebook in my hand, wondering what the fuck people were talking about. But <laughs> I didn't, I don't care anymore. But uh, I know better, but you, we cared then about that. I care what you said. And you said some wretched, wretched, disastrous things. Uh, I remember going to the Barnes Hospital in goddamn St. Louis, driving out there and trying to get Eagleton's medical records. 
Thanks for jumping about a thousand percent. Anyway, we did care then. It was fun. And I thank you for that, for bringing me into a humdinger of a, just a way of participating in politics. And I'm, I'm into local politics now, but that's the way it should be. Even a 22 percent loss. <laughs> God. I was going to ask, there's also out of that, there's a book called Boys on the Bus, which became out. Tim Prowse became a famous book from 72 campaign. And um, I just wanted to ask Morris Dees what, what it was like, climate was like when you were on the road with some of these journalists and on the bus and kind of capturing some well, of the when you write when you write letters, you can uh, fax them in and you can have a lot of free time on a campaign. After being on the back of the bus uh, with uh, Hunter for a while, I had to go to al -Anon. Uh, and, um, and that was just that was just from the smoke because I didn't don't do stuff like that. I grew up in the six pack generation. It was fun to be on the back of the bus. I got to know a lot of people. Gary Hart was there occasionally, and uh, Shirley MacLaine and Warren Beatty and everybody. And Frank dropped in occasionally and set us all straight. It was uh, it was a great experience for me, and it uh, obviously took a person who from Alabama and from a small cotton farm, never been outside the state much until Senator McGovern called me. For some reason, he thought I ran a direct mail printing company because one of his aides, Yancey Martin, a black guy who was from Montgomery, misunderstood what I did down there, and McGovern wanted to get this letter out, and he just asked me to come do the printing. That's when companies could give money, and Dwayne Andrews and others coined that pretty well. But uh, as it turned out, it was a great uh, opportunity for me to meet a lot of people, Doug, and, and to then go on to work in as Carter's finance chairman and uh, Senator Kennedy's and others. So uh, it was a great education. I saw it as a, as a crusade also because I was very, very much opposed to the war in Vietnam. And as much as I was any uh, outrages that the Ku Klux Klan and, and uh, brutal Southern sheriffs and others had committed against blacks in the South, I thought it was a, a, a civil rights moral outrage what our country was doing to the citizens of North and South Vietnam. So it gave me a chance to be a part of a, of a, of a worldwide crusade for human rights. I'm just curious if, if the panelists recall, um, the, the four that were on the campaign, um, if they recall where they were when Watergate occurred. Frank, do you have any, yeah, when, the, exactly. when the break-in occurred? I was in the fucking hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think I was probably the first to know um, that the morning after um, the morning after the break-in, I was in New York um, having breakfast with Larry O'Brien. Uh, we were going over things like where the delegates were going to be seated and the order of the roll call and important matters and uh, uh, agenda. And uh, in the middle of breakfast, uh, Head waiter brought over a phone and said, Mr. O'Brien, you got a call. And Larry took the call and he's listening and, and he was talking to Ira Kaperstein, who was his deputy and a wonderful man and uh, who had been calling him then from Washington. And I'm listening to Larry and he's saying things like they did. <laughs> really? How many of them? And, and they all had Spanish names? That's odd. He says. <laughs> uh, but then he got to the crucial question. He said, well, what did they take? Really? <laughs> well, he said, keep me posted, Ira. And he hangs up. And he said to me, well, now that's fascinating. He said, there's somebody, some people broke into our office last night. Uh, the cops say they all had the Spanish names. Uh, they didn't take anything. We had a lot of typewriters, a lot of TV sets. They didn't take anything. Um, and... Uh, I said, well, okay, you know, now let's get serious about hotel rooms and how many we get and where. And then Larry said something that, uh, that kind of stuck with me. He said, you know, it's odd. He said, the cops said it looked as though they were prepared to stay there all weekend. And I thought, my first thought, I must say, was in Washington without air conditioning? <laughs> It's a water gate, man. It's, it's but then I began to, began to think about it, and I thought, that really is odd. And of course, uh, a couple of days later, it turned out that uh, James McCord, who was head of security for the Nixon campaign, was one of the burglars, the only one without a Spanish name. And um, that sort of convinced us that uh, the Nixon campaign, at least, was in on it. And knowing Nixon's character over the years, it seemed to us highly unlikely that he would not be involved himself. Uh, and that's how it turned out. But I, 
I must say that first morning it didn't didn't strike me as a as an event that was going to shake the nation. Despite what I kept telling you. Let <laughs> me make one thing clear: that one of the great high pleasures of my of, of my life is meeting Frank Megawitz and making and being friends with him through this campaign. Uh, I've never before or since seen a situation where I could drive out to what, Chevy Chase. You know, two in the morning, hammer on the door, and wake up Frank and demand to know what the real story was. We got to be <laughs> uh, good friends, and then, uh, he was the best of uh, of that breed, as far as I'm concerned. He's a good person to work with, maybe the the best ever. I uh, hate to think about Pierre, but I think that, I think he was right on that. I think. If you came up with a story like that, I'd, I'd support you. I think it's true. <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> okay. Do we have some questions from the audience? Yes, in the far back there. Go. Uh, yes, I'm wondering if anyone has any additional stories or memorable quotes from Spiro Agnew regarding George McGovern. <laughs> I don't know. Visual? I don't know about that, Doug, but Senator McGovern made a decision early on. He probably doesn't even know he made. And he may not have made it, but Gary said he did. This, fel this fellow named McCord in the White House uh, also is a, the security director for the Committee to Re-elect the President and the uh, uh, National Republican Committee, the RNC. And being a Southern trial lawyer, when we, I heard that four days after the break-in that this McCord fellow was in, the, I, just, you know, I said, well, I'll call Gary, because McGovern uh, you know, uh, had said, and I, I think he was rather naive, but if he became president, I would be his attorney general. I was only 20-something years old, but maybe that's how he lured me into the campaign. But, uh, so I took him serious, though. And so I said, well, to Gary, I said, let's file a suit against uh, the Republican committee and the committee to re-elect the president and all that, because, you know, it's just no coincidence there's McCord guys, their security director, both of these groups, and also got caught in that Watergate building. So four or five days after the break-in with Senator McGovern's approval, uh, we filed a civil lawsuit Ed Bennett Williams and Joe Califano signed their name to it, and I drafted it and, and filed it in federal district court here in Washington, D.C. And I had lunch recently with John Ehrlichman because he was one of the fellows we sued. We sued Ehrlichman, Harleman, Stans, Mitchell. Uh, we sued hell everybody and, uh, and, and committed to re-elect the president and all of them. And Ehrlichman told me, he said, you know what, because Mr. Bennett Williams quickly took their depositions of everybody, and it nailed them down to stories that screwed them later because they could never change their story. See, there had been no Watergate scandal at that point. Nothing had broken out. And Mr. Williams had the inside story from the Watergate and the deep throat and everybody else, so he knew what to ask, and he, and he deposed uh, all of those officials, and all of them had to take a story under oath about their relationship with everything. And later, as Mr. Ehrlichman told me the other day at lunch, he said, uh, he said you know, that lawsuit really locked us into a position. And uh, that was a, uh, maybe had something to do with this, Mr. Nixon's demise. Ehrlichman, incidentally. Yeah. Ehrlichman, incidentally, this August has a documentary on Watergate he's been working on, and, and it apparently has some new revelations about that, unless that's just a ploy to get us to see it. But uh, he's, he's been working very hard on a documentary which will be coming out on Watergate this August. Yes, well, let me, let me John say this, Doug. Doug I, the lawsuit was filed, really, I was thinking of money, because Creep had a lot of money, and I was hoping yeah, to get sure it for the campaign. <laughs> but uh, actually, it was, it was settled for around $700,000 after the, you know, Nixon stepped down. Excuse that was me, nothing for them, was it, though? They were, they were dealing with, like, millions of brown bags. They had lots of it. The guy yeah. from Mississippi who kept traveling back and forth with lunch bags full of right. million-dollar bills. <laughs> oh, were, yes, yeah. sir. This for Senator McGovern. I understand he flew with Bob Dole and uh, Gordon Liddy uh, to Richard Nixon's funeral. What was that like? Senator McGovern? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I don't want to make a lot of that other than to say that it seemed to me that the thing to do, he was the former president of the United States, and uh, I thought it was the proper thing to, to be there to recognize his office. He was a dominant figure in American politics uh, during most of my uh, public uh, career. So uh, I didn't share in some of the more excessive praise of uh, the president <laughs> after his death, but I did think the uh, least I could do is be a present for his funeral. 
Did anybody in here see Hunter Thompson's obituary of Richard Nixon? Well, George rolled over, let's face that. Yeah, he rolled over. <laughs> and he wrote and it I had in to Rolling Stone. I wouldn't have written that obituary if it hadn't been for George caving in at the funeral. I was so outraged. I watched that thing, and uh, Jesus, what, Dole, Wilson, Kissinger, and then you, George, of all people. And I thought, this can't go on. I was, I was sitting out on the beach somewhere smoking marijuana with Steve Ambrose, you know, his biographer. <laughs> And I was, I was so sentimental that, that, that Stephen convinced me that Nixon really was a good guy. And uh, <laughs> writer's block, like, well, yeah, he really was. He gave us a lot of fun. But then when I saw you, and I saw Kissinger, and I saw uh, Dole, uh, it, just, it was all pure rotten politics. And they, they came in front of me like a red, orange blaze in my eyes. And that, <laughs> that's when I wrote that, that thing about Nixon. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, the role of the press in a presidential campaign is always interesting. One thing I've enjoyed about the 72 campaign, reading about it, is the stark comparisons of how journalists describe Nixon versus McGovern. For example, uh, Thompson described Nixon as a werewolf and went on with a long bit about McGovern's incredible smile. Norman Mailer in St. George and the Godfather uh, had a nice passage with McGovern likening him to an astronaut and he referred to Nixon as a somber undertaker's assistant. And even more moderate journalists uh, of, uh, showed a clear bias in favor of McGovern. In light of the fact that for his whole political career Nixon talked about the bias of the press, I wonder if the panels would address Nixon's view. Shit. Yeah, he, was a, he was a lying dog. I <laughs> and had every reason to fear the press. I, I, remain, uh, I remain amazed that uh, serious uh, observers of American politics have anything good left to say about Richard Nixon. Um, he was a or, or even that they had it then. You know, there's a, um, there's a portion of the Nixon tapes uh, that's referred to in the Haldeman Diaries and uh, which Cy Hirsch wrote about uh, a couple of years ago and the AP chronicled as well, that I, it, 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 to me it's just it's the beginning and the end of Richard Nixon, uh, and I followed him a long time. I, I was in California when he emerged as a congressional candidate. Uh, in 1972, on the 15th of May, George Wallace was shot out here in uh, Laurel, I think. Yeah. Uh, and the FBI very early on had a report, it turned out to be accurate, that the would-be assassin was a man named Arthur Bremer, yep. and he lived in Milwaukee. And within an hour or two, Nixon has a conversation with Charles Colson in the White House, uh, in which he tells him that what he ought to do is get somebody to go out to Milwaukee, to Bremer's apartment, break in before the FBI gets there and seals it off and plant McGovern literature. Yeah, right. That's the President of the United States talking. And uh, I think once you see that, read that story, um, you, you, you lose whatever shred of respect might remain. Yeah, I, I know he went to China. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, yeah, don't we miss, don't while we, we were in California things? together at the time of the thing, Frank and I had two distinctions. We were both going to UCLA with two other distinguished Californians named Haldeman and Ehrlichman. <laughs> and many years, Frank has always amused me with the remark that at least he and I were still voting. This is when <laughs> Haldeman was still alive. <laughs> but the Jerry Voorhees campaign, I didn't know who Jerry Voorhees was. It was one of the first votes of my life, and I voted for a Democratic congressman who was called a communist because he had visited Russia with a congressional committee during the war. And the campaign which followed against Helen Douglas unleashed a degree of malevolence that I have, that always followed Nixon for me. And I remember rejoicing each time he was defeated. I remember saying after the California gubernatorial thing, hooray! No more Nixon. It's why I'm nervous even here talking about him, because... 
This is his town. I'm just a country boy. If that son bitch comes back, he ain't gonna be looking kindly on me. <laughs> well, he's back. It's also, he it. it's also important to remember that uh, the press could have probably been harder on Nixon than they actually were. I mean, he did not, ha you know, he didn't hold any press conferences. Did not make himself available to the press. And uh, basically, and had Bud Wilkinson throwing up softballs at every one of those televised things. Do you believe in the good fairy and motherhood? He won by 22 yes, points. He won by 22 right. points, so let's, let's, let's face that. We did lose. I think, the, um, I think a major contributor to the, uh, uh, to the situation also was the, was the media's total unwillingness to pick up the Watergate story at all, except yeah. for the Washington Post. And the St. Louis Post is fudge. Part, partly because there is this inbred uh, reluctance on the part of any media outlet to begin a story by saying, the Washington Post said today. Um, and uh, the alternative to that, of course, was to get some investigative reporters of your own and go out and do some work, and that, uh, there was a great reluctance to do that, too. Uh, uh, Frank, was it, the was result it, is that the is Post, back, uh, the Rose Post Rose carried Rose. that story all by itself. No, Where, uh, no, no, Hunter I, says the St. Louis Post. I think the New York Times uh, did that editorial that I, I quoted. And, yeah, the St. Louis Post dispatch was the one that did that, that editorial themselves and that statement that I quoted that, you know, uh, it really had happened. It was one of the few papers in the, in the country. Yeah, but television left it alone except yeah, for right. one piece by uh, Cronk. Walter Cronkite. Morse, you wanted to get in this? Not on that exact point, but one of the legacies I thought that the 1972 campaign would leave would be campaign finance reform. And we did come in with the limit on contributions. And I think it's sad today to see how both parties have abused that. Oh, uh, and sure I, and I would hope some kind of way would, that could be straightened out because McGovern's campaign proved, it, proved that small contributors around the country would support a campaign. The Republicans know this works. They have a very large mailing list. Yet we still see that we have to go to Indonesia and other countries to raise money for our campaigns. And I think that just sullies the whole process. <laughs> Two questions here. John Prado's first, and then we'll, we'll get you, OK? okay. Um, Mr. Mankiewicz mentions the, the story about Bremer uh, and Colson. And that illustrates, I think, a certain attitude towards dirty tricks other than Watergate at the lower level, at the campaign level in the Republican campaign in 72. I know those kinds of things were prevalent in New York City, which, where I saw. Uh, I would like to get some kind of reading on, on how detrimental to McGovern's efforts do you think were sort of counter-political activities by Republican campaign organizations? Dirty tricks. I'm not sure I understand the question. To how much dirty tricks affected the campaign? Oh. Other than Watergate kind of thing. Little dirty tricks. I think, uh, I think to some extent, not, uh, not an extraordinary amount. I think the, the, they affect the campaign if they're ignored. Uh, if they had been adequately uh, adequately reported, all of them, including the let's say the Bremer thing, uh, result could very well have been different. I was impressed with what Bob Schrum had to say too, which is that that the the, the the tragedy of 1972 was not that George McGovern lost, but the the nature of the loss. If he if 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 three or four things had gone differently, including I think the. Uh, uh, problem with uh, Senator Eagleton. Uh, he, he probably would have lost, uh, but he would have won 10, 15 states uh, and a reasonable number of electoral votes at worst, maybe one. Frank, uh, said and then Frank, have been, and then have been a fairly obvious choice for the Democratic Party in 1976 uh, and served two distinguished terms as president. Yeah, but uh, Frank, you said that the press coverage was a huge factor in the uh, I, I think so. The loss? Sure. In what way, though? No, oh, your president helped me in a second. Exactly. Well, because, uh, because a lot of the true events of the campaign went uncovered, including Watergate, for openers. If the coverage had been better, you think it would have altered the, uh, the outcome? Yeah, it would have altered the outcome. Whether it would have changed the, uh, whether it would have meant the difference between winning and losing, I don't know. But it certainly would have meant the difference between a landslide and a, and a respectable loss. Well, Nixon's a player in this as well. I mean, his foreign policy and domestic maneuverings late in the term also, you know, uh, showed him to be a better leader than perhaps uh, people 
had thought in 1970. He was yeah, good. I don't he agree with that. Right, exactly. I don't, I don't agree with that at all. No, but any incumbent president has many, many coins in the fountain to use to take advantage of the position, and that's considered sort of fair game. But what I objected to about the whole Nixon thing was coming to Washington. First of all, I'm not wild about Washington as a place to be. Every politician that ever lost an election still lives there, and it makes me a little nervous. Somehow I feel I'm supporting them. But the thing about not just Watergate and not just dirty tricks, but the campaign itself was a foul campaign. Almost all of the public statements were lies. Most of the commercials which were run by the Nixon campaign were untruths. And they did it with a straight face and the, and the American press, supposedly so vigilant, let them get away with it. Yeah. Today they run little things about commercials and say, well, this isn't really true and that, and there was none of that in 72. And here we are with a wonderful fellow named Guggenheim making honest commercials for McGovern that are truly representing him and his position. And so we were here we were operating in an absolutely marked deck and not getting any cards. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to win under those circumstances. I don't care what the game is. Yes, and I, I fault the press. I fault every element of the press for not at some point in time saying, wait a minute. Yeah, but they, has it improved that he's in sin? You think? Uh, or, I the don't, press think, is bad about I don't think they've improved. Now all they, everybody polls everybody else. Yeah, I think it's worse though. I mean, I think today every news organization, even in Charlotte, we run polls on sheriff's races to the degree that they used to do for presidential elections. A, a campaign to, you know, we, of course, I don't have real senators like other states because we have Jesse Helms. And, <laughs> <laughs> but he spent, he spent so much money, he spent $31 million defeating Jim Hunt one time, and I, at my house, got 22 mailings, some of them in color. Now, anybody who has a dumb enough mailing organization to send me 22 mailings for, for Jesse Helms either has an excess of money or a lack of brains. <laughs> but the whole press at the lower levels today, and I'm in that business and have been for most of my adult life, the press today is an absolutely derelict. I mean, every time I pick up the paper, they say the whole business about the campaign reform thing and this and that, is, that's what everybody in America is thinking about. Nobody in Charlotte, I can't talk to Washington, D.C., but there ain't a soul in Charlotte that's the least interested in campaign reform because they view that as some rich guy giving money to some other rich guy and not coming to them for it. You might want to and say, they don't care. Stan and yet Oak. that's all the press seems to be involved in. He owns, I believe, the Charlotte Leader. Is that correct? Or you that's right. I'm just a little weekly he newspaper, but I do get to write in it and I say what I think. You yeah, but, but Stan, sure what, Stan what do you make of the, the, uh, the numbers that uh, the more untrustworthy Clinton is perceived to be in the, by the electorate, the more electable he... Uh, but I'm not so know. sure the electorate feels that. No, it's the media. The, the, the media thinks, well, the yeah, media thinks, polls, well, just... I understand, the polls are, are, are polls of polls. I don't think and they ought to be in Warsaw. The point I make is that <laughs> everybody wants to know, is the president working for me? And nobody much gives a damn about what happened in Arkansas 15 years ago in those terms. Now, I live in a town with 2% unemployment. I live in a town that discovered racial justice because all of a sudden there's no employees to find and people change colors overnight in some racist establishments. So I live in a very successful town, as is, are many places don't in America, and they don't give a damn about these other things. Let me get this gentleman, and he's been patiently waiting. Enter the fray. I think we have a clue as to uh, what the panel thinks of uh, Richard Nixon. Could, 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 could you get into what the campaign's relationship was uh, with former President Johnson? Uh, Where's Larry O'Brien? Well, it was not, not, not uh, terribly important. Johnson had taken himself out of the presidential race and in effect taken himself out of, a, out of politics. He was not well. Um, obviously, he certainly didn't uh, admire Senator McGovern's position uh, on the war. Uh, I think uh, Senator McGovern paid him a visit during the campaign. Uh, went down, talked to him. Uh, as I recall, the president advised him to take a nap every day, uh, which is good advice, but, uh, uh, 
but uh, no, that that uh, relationship I don't think was very good uh, at the beginning of the campaign. But I don't think it had very much impact uh, on the election. The president, uh, uh, in effect, uh, let it be known had well, obviously had let it be known that uh, Senator McGovern was not his choice as the nominee. But uh, he didn't do very much about it. Uh, he respected the. Uh, judgment of the party and the primaries and the convention, and he stayed out of it. Thank you. I think we're going to have to stop. I'm sorry I can't get the other questions, but I'm trying to keep us on time. I'd like to thank all of our panelists. Let me ask one last question, if I can. George, I've been going over this, and it's haunted me. Why did Harold Hughes betray you that day in February? I've been going back over that book and in the details. When, when Harold Hughes went off for Muskie, it's an unanswered question. It's haunted me ever since then. Yeah, he was the, uh, we, were, we were counting on him. He had died by then, hadn't he? No, no, man, that was 72. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall. Me either. For real? I, don't know what was in his mind. I wish I could tell you, but. Jesus, an unsolved mystery, Bill. Well. We're gonna take, we'll take <laughs> yeah. a break just for about five minutes. I'd like to thank our panelists very much. Here's a look at upcoming programming. This Saturday on C-SPAN, a Canadian election preview. As our northern neighbors prepare to go to the polls Monday, we'll look at the candidates and the issues. Our live program begins at noon Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific. And on election night, we'll bring you a live simulcast